Welcome to the Fustel Fit Podcast with your host, Nicola Fustel. Straight talking, body positive coach and personal trainer. Nicola brings you your weekly guide to finding real health and fitness and to live the life you deserve. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Fustel Fit Health and Fitness podcast and radio show on 91.8 Hayes FM. I'm your host Nicola Fustel and this week I had the privilege of speaking to the founder of the Body Image Movement, director and star of the documentary Embrace, it is Taryn Brumfit. And I have to say having met Taryn, I really feel that she is so genuine and authentic and she speaks with such passion that you cannot help but be drawn into every word that she says. And many of us are on the journey to body acceptance, but rarely ever heard of somebody who's actually made it to the destination. And that is body loving, not just acceptance, but really loving your body. And I really feel that Taryn does. So I ask her to explain what is the body image movement for those that don't know? Well, I guess it's fighting back against the toxic ideals that we should conform to one ideal of a body. We often only see in the media uh, a one shape of body celebrated and body image movement is saying can we have some more diversity can we see all shapes sizes abilities of bodies and my role as the founder of body image movement is to harness and facilitate positive body activism right across the globe and what happened to you in your in your own journey to get you to that point where you decided to start the body image movement well um i in a nutshell because that story could go on for quite some time but i hated my body i loathe my body um, in particular after having my three children and I wanted to get my body back and it's such a familiar story for so many women that we want we want our old bodies or we want to lose weight or we just we just want to change ourselves um, and I was going to have surgery to fix what I thought was my broken body and I, I booked in for the appointment I had a boob uh, job and a tummy tuck all lined up and ready to go and then I had this epiphany uh, I was watching my daughter play and I thought how am I going to teach Michaela to love her body if I can't love my body and if I have surgery what message will that be sending her I think it's really important for anyone that's listening that if you've had surgery or if you engage in Botox that's completely fine too I mean these this is my story and my own unique decisions but within this body image movement there's no room for judgment We're all just doing the best we can and we're all individuals so I just want to make note of that so I cancelled the surgery and then um, I was still stuck in this body that I hated and I went to the gym uh, with my trainer one day and I said to her I was really plagued by the thought what does it feel like to have the perfect body and would it make me happy and she said why don't you train for a bodybuilding competition and I was like are you crazy like I'm not doing that and then sure enough I started I trained for 15 weeks I lost a bunch of weight I got up there on stage and for me um, I realized soon after that competition that my body is actually not an ornament it's the vehicle to my dreams and for me to have that particular body shape took too much time and energy and obsession it wasn't sustainable and it didn't make me happy so you say that after having your children, that's when you decided that you hated your body. But had you ever really felt negatively about your body before that? Well, I think on reflection, um, at the time, it didn't feel like it was impacting my life in my teens and my 20s. But then I look back and I think, gosh, but I went on every single diet known to mankind, every detox, every lemon drink detox and only drink bananas between 10 and 11. I mean, I did it all. So um, I, I think it was a, I think it was actually a very normal kind of, I mean, I, I loathe to use that word, but I, I hope your listeners understand, a normal body image that most women go through, the ebb and the flow, the weighing, the dieting, um, but really it was amplified when I had the three kids. <laughs> And then you went into the bodybuilding. What was the process like of the dieting then? How did you find that? Um, it was um, very restrictive. And um, for me, I mean, I remember going out for dinner with friends and they would all be eating their food and I'd pull out my Tupperware container of, of chicken, like boiled chicken and rice and some lettuce leaves. And I mean, I, I've 
I'm sorry, but I refuse to believe that's fun for anybody. Look, it wasn't fun for me. And the regime of being at the gym for hours and hours a day, it felt more like punishment than moving my body for pleasure. It um, it was it was very obsessive and it consumed my life. Um, to have that body, it took uh, an enormous amount of obsession and I don't think it made me a particularly nice person to be around. My husband would often say, would you just go and eat some chocolate? You know, because I was so grumpy. I was going to ask yourself, what did your husband think about the whole bodybuilding process? Oh, look, he knows not to stop me from wanting to do something, so he has to kind of go along with some things. Um, um, look, I think throughout the process, he, know, he, he knew how much turmoil I had experienced in terms of my body image and hating my body. So I think he was supportive to give something a, 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 give something a go. You know, let, let me go down that road of trying to get the perfect body and um, but you know we there was a bit of conflict too and it, it took a lot of sacrifice for the entire family um, I'd be up in the morning and and gone before the kids would get up so I wasn't there making their breakfast not that that's my job but that's a kind of a nice thing to do in the morning um, is to be with your family I never felt really present in my life because I was always thinking about the next meal preparation or what I was going to eat what I wasn't going to eat um, how much time I hadn't spent at the gym and how I needed to spend more time at the gym it just it wasn't a way of life for me and it's not a way of life for lots of people too but they're on that treadmill because they think that that's what they have to do to to have a happy existence in the world yeah. and then when you had your epiphany and you decided not to go ahead with the surgery and, and you wanted to change your life and love your body how what was that process like how did it happen was it overnight or was it a lengthy process well, um, the epiphany happened immediately and I decided against the surgery. Next came the bodybuilding competition. It was only really after that that I discovered this whole, my body is not an ornament, it's the vehicle to my dreams and how am I going to think differently? It doesn't happen overnight. You don't wake up miraculously one day and love your body. You know, it's, it was a work in progress in those early days and I think it's like a muscle that you grow. Um, and now, I mean, now it's just... Um, I, I don't ever have a bad day about my body. I have unconditional love and respect for it. And um, gosh, it's like brushing your teeth. It's just it's just who I am. But it took some time and energy and effort in those early days. And along those early days, which moment did you decide I want to make the, the movie, the documentary in place? Um, when did I decide to make Embrace? Well, it became a very obvious choice to make when I received 7,000 emails and messages from women, mostly women, some men, but mostly women around the world. I just, I felt this level of responsibility to do something with that information. And having hated my body and I learnt myself how to love my body, I felt like I'd, I'd won the golden ticket and I wanted to share that message and that story with as many people as I could. Also, I'd come across many inspiring stories, so I thought it's not my story that I want to share, it's, it's Ricky Lakes and it's Tina, the girl that suffers from anorexia, and it's Taria Pitt who survived um, burns to 70% of her body or, you know, there's these really fascinating characters in the film and I just, I wanted to give their stories life because I knew that it could inspire women to make a better choice about the relationship with their body. Um, filmmakers probably wanted to kill me because because when I, I was very nonchalant in my approach to, I'll just make a documentary, like, you know, how hard could that be? <laughs> but it's really hard making a documentary. It took two years, um, travelled the world, um, and it was tiring, it was taxing, um, it was like a big emotional roller coaster. But we're, we're here now, and what a great way to convey a message is, is getting in front of people for 90 minutes through film. And was there ever a moment during the making of Embrace that you felt inauthentic and not feeling that confident in your own body? I never. No, because by that stage I'd founded the body image movement um, and I was out on, you know, this crusade, I guess, to find and discover stories and um, I just I haven't, I haven't looked back in, in years. So during the movie, I mean, I've seen it, and there's the moment that you stand in the surgery in the room with that surgeon and I just I was crying my eyes out <laughs> thinking about you. And um, how did that make you feel? Did it? Although obviously you loved your body already by then, but yeah. knowing that somebody else could think these ways about your body... How did that make you feel? Well, 
um, it doesn't make me feel for myself, it makes me feel pain for others. Me standing there, um, getting my body torn to shreds, which is basically what happened to that Beverly Hills surgeon scene. Um, you know, I'm in my knickers and he declares everything that's wrong with my body, where my nipples should be. I mean, the language was super toxic and it was fine for me. You might have seen crazy eyes when I was looking at him um, because I had so much I wanted to say, but I just thought I'm going to let it unfold. But I remember walking out after that and thinking the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women around the world that experience that, that walk in those doors feeling really lousy about their bodies and then have that person say to them, yep, it's lousy and you need to change basically everything. I mean, it's crushing. Um, so I think it was a really important part of the documentary to kind of expose what happens behind the scenes in a, in a surgeon's office. Yeah. And how do you feel now about certain companies claiming that they're body positive and then still selling weight loss? <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> I mean, I've had I've had many companies approach me and wanting wanting to do something with me, and it's a big it's a big fat no, because um, this this message is this body image movement. You know, this this journey that so many of us are on and collaborating and coming together. You know, like we are today, we are doing it from a very pure space, a very authentic space of wanting to help others. And time and time again, I see organizations, companies, diet industry, beauty industry, the fashion industry, really pushing out these toxic messages and then trying to play in the space of body positivity too. I don't think you can have it both ways. Um, but the power of people pushing back against the toxic messages is, is what's going to make them change. Great, we've obviously got lots of attention from the media and most of it is good, but there's obviously some bad things that come along with it as well and some trolls commenting on things on Facebook and so on. How did that make you feel? What do you say to the trolls and people saying that you're promoting obesity? Well, I mean, there's always going to be nasty people in the world um, and, you know, they're probably often miserable in their own world and uneducated to this bigger issue of, of body image. So um, I try not to spend too much time or energy worrying or thinking about what their thoughts are. Um, in terms of promoting obesity, it's something that comes up over and over again. Uh, the questions often asked to me in media interviews. And I always push back on that notion because I don't know a single human being on the planet that has made positive, lifelong, meaningful change that's come from shame or fear or guilt. So I know when people, because I've seen it with my very own eyes, with this film and with this movement, when, when people people uh, give their body self-care and self-love and self-respect and have self-esteem, they make better choices for themselves because they look after this body. So um, I just think we've done what we've done for uh, so many years. Diets don't work. We know that. I mean, diet, uh, a four-letter word where the first three letters spelled die. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's a sign, right, from the universe. Never go on one. 95% of diets don't work. And you mentioned there about education as well. Are you an advocate for health at every size? Oh, yeah. I mean, Dr. Linda Bacon, the founder of Health at Every Size, is in the film. She's phenomenal. Um, and she has, like, a triple degree. She's the smartest person I've ever, you know, come in contact with in my life. And she's in... Her message just makes so much sense. And I, I often share the story in terms of, of health. I try to get the penny to drop for people when I'm, when I'm telling stories because I think for such a long time we've believed what we've believed and it takes something to kind of snap us out of it. But in terms of health... Um, my brother uh, was, uh, gosh, he was, people always thought, uh, tall, dark, handsome, uh, handsome, charismatic. That's how people described him. He, uh, he played Sean Penn's movie double in The Thin Red Line. So to the observer, to the outsider, he had it all. Now, if I put Jason next to an overweight man and then asked 100 people, who do you think's healthier out of these two men standing here? They all would have chosen Jason. And he was a heroin addict and he subsequently died from his addiction so you can't see health you can't see it. it's not possible and we really need to judge less in this whole movement we don't know what's going on for someone behind closed doors like the woman that 
reached out to me and shared her story of being sexually abused as a child. She wrote to me and said, I'm in my 20s, I have a couple of children, I'm fat, and I get that. And I walk down the street and I feel so judged for being fat. But what people don't know, and what I've never shared with anyone, I mean, that's huge for me, right? She, she shared for the first time in her life that she suffered from sexual abuse. Um, she said, what people don't know is I am just trying to survive every day. You know, so I am just keeping my head above the water, um, as in my emotional and my mental health. I'm trying to survive for my two kids, but it's a battle. So we can't look at health as one dimensional. It's not just the physical, it's emotional, it's mental, it's spiritual, it's all of those things. But on a constant basis, we have the messages of the physical health that's just rammed down our throats and we only often see one type of um, a particular person and a particular body shape that is the example of health. So, and as we know, because Dr. Linda Bacon and many people are talking about health at every size, comes in a variety of forms. But can we see more of it, media? <laughs> Do you feel, though, that you have to prove yourself how healthy you are that you are in the body that you're in, but yet you run marathons and that you drink green smoothies and that kind of thing. Um, I don't feel like I need to prove anything to anyone. I mean, if someone wants to challenge me, I'd say, well, come for a run with me and keep up. Or, <laughs> no, I, I'd be really nice. I mean, it's not a competition, right? Um, but I think we just need to educate. It's an education process. Anyone that challenges my health, I say, well, you don't know the first thing about me. You don't know what's going on. Because um, in the media at the moment, we used to talk about skinny all the time, then strong is the new skinny, and now it seems to be health is the new skinny. So health seems to be a massive obsession at the moment. Yeah, but isn't there like a new fad all the time? I mean, you've just mentioned two. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just like I was saying earlier about the diets, you know, the lemon detox, the green smoothie, the eat the banana, the don't eat the banana, eat between this time. I mean, there's always a new fad um, it, it, for health and for body image and for human beings. And I think what's happened is we've become so disempowered. We've, we've lost our sense of um, what's best for us. And I think we need to re remind ourselves that no one knows our body like we know our body. And now that you love your body, will you continue to love your body if it changes again? Of course. I mean, this body is going to change again. Um, it's, it's the evolution of being a human being is that you are constantly changing. Hence why it's so damaging for people to, for example, try and get their body back after you've had a child. You can't do that. We don't, as human beings, go backwards. We keep evolving until the day that we die. So I want to embrace every age and every stage. And as I get more wrinkles on my face, you now I look at them and think they're that they remind me that life is short and the bucket list is long. Um, I'm very grateful for being here and whatever form this body chooses to take, um, I'm going to I'm gonna live life, embrace my body and, and get on with it. And I hope lots of people do after they've seen Embrace too. And have you ever experienced fat shaming before? And when you hated your body, did you ever judge other people the way that they looked? Um, yes. I have experienced fat shaming. I mean, you see it in the film. There's a lot of trolls that um, come after me for, for being fat and all of those things. Um, and when I was loathing my body and hating my body, I, I would look at other people differently. Um, um, and I, I probably was one of those people that would judge. In, I would never verbalise it, but I would certainly in my head have a preconception of who someone was or what someone was able to do based on what they look like. So um, I'm not proud to say that, but that's the evolution of what, you know, of, of my life too. And I think that's the conversation that, that, that we all need to be part of is to, to talk about the things that we've probably been brainwashed into believing for such a long time and acknowledging that it's not fun to hate and loathe your body um, and to judge other people. It's not a nice space to, to live your life from. But the alternative to that is really freeing and loving and, and it just feels really good to go through life not judging yourself, not judging anyone else and simply embracing your body.
Did you learn a lot from the characters in the documentary and did it make it feel kind of small thinking about fat and thin and the shape of your body considering the, the big things that the, these people have gone through? Um, I Gosh, I love the characters in the film. I mean, a lot of them, and I, I think all of them, are lifelong friends now. Um, what what magical women with with truly um, uh, remarkable stories. Um, sorry, the second part of that question, what was that? Did it make it feel small worrying about the size and shape of your body compared to what they've been through? Um, Yes, and it's actually one of the one of the conversations that I have with lots of people is, um, say, someone in the film like a Taria a Taria Pitt who suffered seventy percent burns to her body. Look, I ref I refuse to believe. Um, that you can stand in front of a mirror and worry about your cellulite or your stretch marks when there's someone that exists like that in the world who's experienced so much more. And look, comparison can be quite a dangerous game and I would never recommend someone who suffers from depression or anxiety or an eating disorder to... to, to to play that game of, of comparison. But I reckon for lots of us, we can probably take a lot from it and 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 think about our own existence and go, do you know what? We are pretty lucky. I mean, anyone that watches Embrace or sees a screening probably um, has a roof over their head, head and food on the table and feels safe in their environment. I mean, we, we are we are headed ahead of the game in terms of the human race and the tragedies that really are a tragedy in the world. So it's that whole perspective and gratitude thing. Yeah. Um, what's next for the body image movement and where do you see the role of the ambassadors going in the future? <laughs> Well, um, gosh, there's so much to do. Um, we're releasing here in the UK and Ireland. We head back to, to the United States and Canada for release and then parts of Europe. The next step is to um, to roll out the education study guides for all high schools across the globe. That's a really big one for me. Um, so many young teenagers are really suffering and I know this film can help them. So an education rollout is um, it's a pretty big undertaking, but I think it's really Really necessary. In terms of the ambassadors, the ambassadors have been, uh, we call them the BIMGAS, Body Image Movement Global Ambassadors. It's the longest name ever to get your, get your mouth around. But this movement truly wouldn't be what it is without them. There are over 800 women, mostly women, I think there's like two men around the world that are sharing the missions and the va values and, um, and the goals of the movement in their communities. It's so very helpful. Um, we're going to start training this year, connecting more, um, coming together. And at some stage, and this is the first time I've said this, but I'm, I've put it out there to the universe now. I want to pull, of, pull all of us together and have a conference where we can sit around and really plan a strategy to, to build on this beginning of a global movement of change. Time zones might be an issue. <laughs> no, no, we've got to get everyone to a certain spot. Oh, wow. Like, yes. Can you fly us over, please? <laughs> That's exactly what I have put out there. I mean, it'll be an ultimate massive and it'll require a ton of money. Um, but there, there are so many good people in that ambassador group. Um, some do more than others, and that's cool too. We were interrupted a little bit here, so I, I go on and ask Taryn my last question. One of the things Taryn always says is, what are you going to be thinking when you take your last breath? And are you going to be thinking about your, your wobbly bum and your cellulite? So I wanted to ask her. A similar question, and that is, what does she, what would she like to be remembered for? Um, it's a really tough question. Hopefully someone that's made a, a positive impact on the world, and I would like to think that I could get to uh, the end of my life and um, believe that I've made a, a significant contribution um, that perhaps started a global movement of positive change. That would be amazing. If you'd like to know more about the body image movement, go to www.bodyimagemovement.com. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave Nicola a review on iTunes. You can also check out the show notes and get other free content on her website, fustalfit.co.uk. If you'd like to contact Nicola, email nicola at fustalfit.co.uk.